Welcome back to New Rockstars. I'm Hector Navarro, filling in for Eric Voss while he is out on paternity leave. Yay, Yay, Eric! And this is a breakdown of the ninth episode of season seven of Rick and Morty, titled Mort Ragnarok, a play on the third Thor film, Thor Ragnarok. The episode isn't a direct parody of that film, but does contain a lot of MCU references, which we'll be pointing out in this breakdown. This is the penultimate episode of season seven, a season that has seen some big changes to the Smith family, both in the show and behind the scenes. Now let's dive into it. But before we do, be sure to check out nerdriot.shop where you will always find the latest and greatest in new Rockstars merch. There's always something new being added to the site, including some fun new holiday themed merch that's perfect for the nerdy fan on your gift list. Shopping at nerdriot.shop is a great way to support the channel, so check it out today. Thanks. This episode opens with Jerry in what looks like a very stereotypical version of heaven. His grandmother meets him but says Pop Pop isn't coming because it's getting annoying. He's yanked back to life and wakes up in the garage. Rick has apparently been killing him multiple times times to see if there's a heaven. This whole thing is very reminiscent of Flatliners, the 1990 movie where med students bring themselves back from the brink of death. Kiefer Sutherland was in that. This is an interesting experiment for Rick who has confessed to being an atheist multiple times on the show. So apparently there's an infinite energy source out there that uses people's cultural view of heaven to reel them in. Morty, there's kind of a heaven, kind of. I mean, there definitely is for a neurotypical like your father. Rick isn't interested in getting in to heaven, but harnessing the energy of the dimension. But Rick's search for energy could just be a cover for a more personal search for meaning. Rick has been feeling rudderless since killing Rick Prime earlier this season. It's possible that our Rick is still holding on to hope that his murdered wife, Diane, is out there somewhere. But he's framing it as a search for energy because of his pride. At least that's what I thought when this whole episode started. He doesn't want to go to Jerry's Christian-y 80s movie version of heaven, but finds one that he's more interested in. He tells Morty, Morty, pack your parka. We're going to Norway. Rick and Morty set up a base in Norway. Rick says that he's going to Valhalla. In Norse mythology, Valhalla is the Hall of Slain Warriors, a version of the afterlife where warriors killed in battle feast on boar meat and drink liquor that flows from the udder of a goat. The legends say they will stay there until Odin needs them to help fight the giants. This isn't the first time Rick and Morty have been in a Norse mythology setting. There's a SpawnCon, which stands for Sponsored Content, video from last year where they go to the world of the video game God of War Ragnarok. Rick has a clone of himself in a jar, the computer says, Phoenix Protocol initiated. This is Rick's contingency plan for his death where his consciousness is uploaded into a waiting clone. We've seen it used in episodes like Big Trouble in Little Sanchez and Edge of Tomorty, Rick Die Repeat. Rick says he needs to die in glorious battle to get into Valhalla. He produces a Pokeball that contains Bigfoot. A death by Sasquatch was foreshadowed in this season when the president assembles a half-assed task force to deal with the Unity hive mind. One of the members is Flea Florp, an alien who can maybe predict the future with childlike drawings. He drew Rick getting mauled by Bigfoot, which actually happens in this episode. I gotta give us a little pat on the back for this one. We predicted it here at New Rockstars and even made it our thumbnail in our breakdown for that episode. Still taking this to school, Eric Voss. <laughs> Nicely done. Rick enters a chamber covered in Norse runes. This looks like troll. This one looks like courage. This one looks like need or hardship. This could be elder tree or feminine energy, dance or sexuality. Honestly, all four of those, basically the same thing. This one could mean protection, although the line across the top might be altering that meaning somehow. Rick takes a slug of his flask, could be to numb the pain for his impending death or just because, you know, he's Rick. He tosses down the Pokeball and releases Bigfoot who almost immediately smashes his face to a pulp. This is chillingly similar to the bare-fisted beating Rick gave Rick Prime in episode five. I guess Rick is Bigfoot's nemesis, his Rick Prime, if you will. Rick materializes in the middle of a field and exclaims, I'm dead Rick! A callback to the adjective-based Rick's like, I'm tiny Rick! and the now ubiquitous, I'm Pickle Rick! He's killed again in the middle of a Viking battle and materializes in Valhalla. He's greeted by a Viking with a down arrow tattoo that looks kind of like the markings on the DC character Red Tornado, although this guy's arrow seems to be pointing to his dong. We can see a tapestry on the wall featuring two birds. This is probably a reference to Odin's ravens, Huggin and Munin, but we're also reminded of the two crows storyline from season five. Great Odin's ravens! Rick heads to the blacksmith for some armor and sees a hammer clearly inspired by Thor's Mjolnir and knocks out the blacksmith. Back at the research station, Bigfoot tricks Morty into opening his cell by pretending to pray and cry over Rick's dead body. Morty fell for a similar prey when caught tactic from previous Leon in the season six episode, Full Meta Jack Rick. Bigfoot crushes Morty, casually ambles out, and then tries to get at Rick's clone. Morty lands in the battlefield, gets killed, and ends up in Valhalla. This afterlife seems to have a two-step process where you die in the battlefield and then move to the hall. The Vikings take him to Rick, who's using their tools to build his energy machine. He casually tells them, I'm actually Odin. Odin? Yep, Thor's father, Spider-Man's uncle, etc. 
Rick has apparently mashed up the MCU, Marvel Cinematic Universe, and actual Norse mythology, but there is a What If comic from 1982 where Aunt May marries Odin instead of Uncle Ben. So that's definitely a deep cut to that. Nicely done, Rick and Morty writers. Morty rides up on a dopey looking goat and Rick blasts the Vikings when they call him a witch. This isn't the first time Rick has been a reluctant deity. In A Mort Well Lived, he becomes a messiah to a world of video game NPCs that have Morty's fragmented consciousness. Back at the lab, Bigfoot is trying to smash the Rick clone out of his chamber. He uses Rick's body to whack it. Eventually, he cracks the glass using one of Rick's legs that has a cybernetic implant. This causes the clone to go into survival mode and it runs around like an idiot. Since it doesn't have Rick's consciousness uploaded into it yet, I guess this is all it's capable of. Bigfoot chases the clone into town and is captured by Norwegian police who look to be wearing real life accurate uniforms. Nice detail. Two agents pull up and take Bigfoot. They have little golden Illuminati pins on their jackets. They bring Bigfoot before the Pope who says, Hello, Bigfoot. I'm at a pub. This reminds me of the punchline to this classic sketch from The State. The Pope says he's going to use Bigfoot to kill the church's enemies because they can't kill anyone themselves. They even have the Rick clone crucified as bait to control Bigfoot. They even cover up his naughty bits with a leaf, something the Catholic Church would often do to ancient works of art they deemed improper. You know what? There's nothing worse than a blank wall. I mean, look at me. I'm sitting here against an infinite field of blue. These walls could use some personality. Somebody call Display. Display is a one of a kind metal poster designed to capture the things that you are most passionate about and make them easy to show off. Display posters are magnet mounted, so they're easy to rearrange. And because they're metal, they won't bend or crinkle or curl at the edges. Display has a ton of posters from popular fandoms like Marvel, Star Wars, DC, Lord of the Rings, and more. We've got a few Star Wars posters for The Office and they look awesome. Display ships worldwide in four to five days, which means you could be out of your blue dungeon Dungeon in less than a week. Uh, not me. I live here now. To get started with Displate and support new rock stars, just click the link in the description below. Use the code ROCKSTARS and you'll get 22% off your order if you order one or two Displates and 33% off your order if you order three. Once again, just click the link in the description below and use the code ROCKSTARS to get 22% off an order for one or two Displates and 33% off for an order three. Back in Viking heaven, Rick continues to work on his machine while Morty defends him from Viking hordes using a chain gun. Rick says they're not going home until he finishes his infinite energy machine. You think the next time these idiots see a naked man on the battlefield, they're gonna give him a beer? In a montage, Morty kills the Vikings with increasingly brutal weapons, landmines, a mortar, wooden drones that he flies using a wooden VR headset. Each time they die, they teleport back to the hall. Rick says he can use the infinite energy to send them back in new bodies. Morty wonders if the Vikings won't just attack the lab. Rick has a plan for that, though. We see a missile hit the hall, and the Vikings rematerialize back in the crater that it leaves. Rick and Morty fly overhead in makeshift wings that look like the jankier versions of the vultures in Spider-Man homecoming. Rick is carrying the hammer and has a little crown that says God on it. He calls Morty Spider-Man. Running with his MCU slash Norse mythology mashup, he has Morty laser some commandments about not going near the energy relay into the rocks. Back in the Bigfoot B story, the Pope uses Rick's dumb clone as bait. He drops it on a cult of Satanists. They look kind of like the cult members from Resident Evil 4, but with blood pentagrams on their heads. In one shot, one of them is actually sucking blood off her fingers. Bigfoot wrecks shop at the Satanist lair. We see him knock down an arch covered in what looks like alchemical symbols and or demonic sigils. An altar to the right of the screen has a book which might be the Key of Solomon, a magic textbook from the 14th or 15th century. The Pope recaptures Bigfoot and drops him into the offices of Gajungas, a secular nudie magazine. Probably a nod to Hustler, who often made fun of and antagonized the church. Bigfoot does target practice on a devil target using a crossbow gauntlet. It kind of reminds me of the Phantom Blade weapon from the Assassin's Creed games. Bigfoot then gets dropped into a non-dominational candle factory. The Pope gives him a communicator that he says he got from a predator. He's of course talking about the monster from the franchise of the same name that wears a similar multi-purpose gauntlet. The Pope says he traded three muskets for it. We saw the predator in episode one of this season, How Poopy Got His Poop Back. Yeah, that's the real name of that episode. In that episode, the predator gives Mr. PB a musket after he accepts the fact that his wife has moved on. We've seen the predators exchange muskets various times in that series. So it is that currency. Rick and Morty zap themselves back into their new clones, but their energy relay isn't working. Bigfoot breaks in and smacks 
smacks them around. Bigfoot uses the Predator Gauntlet to tell Rick that the reason he's so mad is that Rick thought he was stupid. That's a big theme in this episode. Rick thinks he's smarter than everyone else, and by most metrics, he is, but he's proven to be pretty stupid when it comes to emotions and relationships. Rick shows he's working on his emotional intelligence by tapping into Bigfoot's pain. He says he'll help Bigfoot get out from under the thumb of the Pope. He even upgrades the Predator Gauntlet so Bigfoot's voice is hands-free and doesn't have the halting speak and spell quality to it. Bigfoot demonstrates his new voice by saying, In a world where time actually is money. Here he's probably referring to In Time, the Justin Timberlake sci-fi movie with the time equals money premise. It is packed with tons of strained time puns. They sneak into the Vatican. Bigfoot sneaks past the guard by tapping on his gauntlet and using his halting speech again so he doesn't tip anyone off that Rick upgraded it. The guard takes a selfie with Rick and Morty's supposedly dead bodies and says he needs to poke them with a spear. This could be a reference to the crucifixion of Jesus, where the Bible details that Jesus was stabbed with a spear by the Romans to make sure he had died, and instead of blood, water flowed from the wound. Either way, this blows their cover and they go in guns blazing. The Pope has tapped into the infinite energy and roasts them, sending them back to Valhalla. The tubes of the machine and the floating midair being very Emperor-esque as seen in Star Wars The Rise of Skywalker. They beam back into clones and Bigfoot goes into a summer. Bigfoot summer even has a bit of an underbite. Rick reveals a closet of various models of portal guns. He takes the classic model, but we see a wooden one, kind of like the tech they were making in Valhalla. There's one held together with duct tape with a spoon for a handle. Each time he dies, he'll take another one off the wall. What follows reminds me of the repeating deaths from this season of Loki or the Dormammu, I've come to bargain, seen from the first Doctor Strange movie. And of course, Edge of Tomorrow, which the show parodied in the season four episode, Edge of Tomorty, Rick die repeat. Rick and Morty die again and again by the Pope's Valhalla fire. They give Bigfoot a new non-summer dad bod body. He says me instead of I. Me love it. Me. Dial it back. You don't want to come across like a Muppet. He's probably referencing Cookie Monster. We love Cookie! Hum. And I'll head off any comments telling me that Sesame Street characters aren't Muppets. They do, in fact, count as Muppets. We checked. In one of these attempts, we see Rick has his armor from the Pro Mortius episode in season four. Morty has what looks like an upgraded version of his armor from Look Who's Purging Now in season two. They get chopped up grid style, kind of like the stars team does by the Red Queen in the first Resident Evil movie. Man, that's a deep cut. Bigfoot tells Rick that the Pope has other monsters that can help them. On their next attempt, the Pope says, I can do this all day. Cap's famous catchphrase. Rick summons versions of the classic universal monsters. There's Dracula, the mummy, Frankenstein's monster, Wolfman, and the creature from the Black Lagoon. The Pope zaps them all back to Valhalla, and we see everyone in their human forms. The mummy says, this afterlife smells like beer. Obviously, being from ancient Egypt, his afterlife would have been totally different and presumably less hard drinking than the Viking one. Rick admits to the Vikings that he's been playing them. They chase them back to the energy relay and use the universal monsters as decoys to get away. The Pope asks if they brought the Harlem Globetrotters this time. The basketball stunt men did a ton of cameos back in the day on shows like Scooby-Doo and Gilligan's Island. Since the Vikings took back the relay, the Pope loses his powers. Rick traps the Pope in a Pokeball and it wriggles around before settling, much like it does when you catch a wild Pokemon in the games. Rick grudgingly makes the Pokeball pun we were all thinking of. They take Bigfoot back to the woods and do a tearful, why can't you go back to where you came from scene, much like the goodbye scene from Harry and the Hendersons. They even use the same sappy or orchestral score. The post credit scene takes place in a fighting arena that looks a lot like the one we see in Macau in Shang-Chi and the Legend of the Ten Rings. It's another MCU reference. Rick is facing off against a Pokemon trainer that looks like a legally dissimilar Ash Ketchum. The trainer throws out a dinosaur-looking Pokemon that looks legally dissimilar from Charizard. And Rick throws out the Pope, who is terrified. Everybody flees when police sirens are heard. We cut to the cops comforting the Pokemon fighters, and they reveal that the brainless Rick clone is now the Pope. That's it for us today. I'll be back to break down the season seven finale next Next week, go ahead and follow me on the internet at Hector is Funny and at Heroes Reforged on YouTube. Follow New Rock Stars. Subscribe to New Rock Stars for more analysis of everything that you love. Thank you so much for watching. We'll see you next time. Bye.